Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and welcome to Unit 4 of the APES Ultimate Review Packet. Make sure to have that packet printed out so you can follow along and make sure you're reviewing everything we go over in this video. If you need to jump to a specific topic anywhere within Unit 4, we have the timestamps right here so you can find exactly what you need. If you're ready to think like a mountain and write like a scholar, let's get started. Now, Unit 4 marks our descent, literally and figuratively, into the depths of earth science. So we'll leave behind all the ecology, biodiversity, and population stuff we learned in Unit 3, take a little deeper look at how the earth works. We'll slide our way into plate tectonics, infiltrate our way into watersheds, unearth soil formation and all of its mysteries. We'll make sure to leave no stone unturned or unweathered. Okay, sorry, sorry, I got on a roll. On a topic 4.1. So the first thing we need to review in unit four is plate tectonics and how their boundaries help shape Earth's landforms. Now remember that tectonic plates are basically huge slabs of rock or lithosphere. Now these huge slabs of rock are floating on top of a molten magma sea that we call the mantle. Now the reason that the mantle is a liquid and not a solid is because of the heat given off by the Earth's core. The Earth's core is a dense ball of nickel, iron, and radioactive elements that decay and give off a tremendous tremendous amount of heat. Now that we know why tectonic plates are able to float on top of the mantle, let's review how their movement and their collisions or the boundaries that they form ultimately shape all of the landforms we have on Earth. The first type of plate boundary we'll review is a divergent boundary, and that's where plates are moving away from each other due to a particularly hot portion of the mantle where magma is rising towards the surface and pushing them apart. Because this typically happens between two oceanic plates, we call it seafloor spreading. This is how we get mid-oceanic features like trenches and underwater ridges. Now if we look at the plate on the right of this divergent boundary, we can see that the magma at the divergent boundary is going to force it towards this continental plate. This causes a convergent plate boundary where two plates are colliding. Now because it's more dense, the oceanic plate is going to be subducted or forced beneath the continental plate. Now the subduction of this oceanic plate is going to force magma up through the lithosphere on the continental plate. This is going to lead to volcanic mountain ranges forming along the coast of this boundary. In addition to volcanic mountain ranges, these convergent plate boundaries can also form trenches right at the point where one plate is sliding beneath the other. And finally, we have transformed plate boundaries, sometimes called transform faults, where two plates are sliding past each other in opposite directions. Now these transform plate boundaries are where we're most likely to see earthquakes occur. That's because the two plates are trying to move past each other in opposite directions, but they get stuck or they get locked. So even though the force of the magma beneath them is still pulling them in opposite directions, they're not moving because they're locked with one another. Eventually when the force of the magma beneath them pulling them in opposite directions overcomes the friction between them at this locked fault, they slide all at once, releasing tons and tons of energy through the Earth's surface, and that's what we call an earthquake. Now on topic 4.2 and 4.3, we'll take a look at the most misunderstood and the most underappreciated topic in all of apes, and that's soil, not dirt. And if you don't know the difference, well, you're about to find out. So let's start with understanding what soil exactly is so we can see why it's such a disservice to call it dirt. Soil is a complex mixture of tiny particles of weathered rocks, such as sand, silt, and clay, but it also has organic material such as living microbes or decomposers and non-living organic material like decomposing leaves and animal waste. Soil is also full of empty space and we call this pore space. Pore space is so critical because it allows oxygen and water to fill the soil and that allows plants roots to have access to these two things that they need in order to grow. Now that we've reviewed the components of soil, let's take a look at how it forms. The inorganic or mineral components of soil come from the weathering of rock. So what happens is over time, the force of the rain and the freeze thaw cycle of water breaks the rocks into smaller and smaller pieces. Now we call the rocks that these pieces came from parent material. So there's another reason not to call soil dirt. It has parents after all. How would your parents feel if someone called you dirt? But remember that soil is more than just broken up bits of rock. If we look at different layers or horizons that a well-developed soil has, we can see that the very top layer is actually organic matter. Now we call this the O-horizon because it's filled with organic material like decomposers, plants roots, and partially decomposed biomass, such as dead leaves or other plant matter. Then we have the A horizon, which is also referred to as the topsoil. Now this is a really critical layer of the soil because it contains both organic matter and mineral components of soil. So it's going to contain the nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, as well as the water and oxygen in its pore spaces, all of which are crucial to supporting plant growth. Then there's the B horizon, which we sometimes call subsoil. This horizon is going to contain very little organic material, but it still holds a lot of the nutrients that a plant needs to grow. And then finally, we have the C horizon, which contains the rocks of the parent material that have undergone very little weathering because of how deep they are in the soil. And the final thing we need to go over when it comes to soil formation is the difference between weathering and erosion. While weathering is the breakdown of rocks into smaller and smaller pieces, Erosion is the movement of those rock pieces by the wind and the rain. Now, erosion is a natural process, but it can be worsened by human activity 
and it can degrade soils. See, when erosion carries away some of the topsoil in an area, it removes a lot of the nutrients and the microorganisms and bacteria in the area that are so vital to plant growth. Another reason that the erosion of soil is so problematic is that soil is a really good groundwater filtration system. See, when it rains, precipitation hits the soil and begins to seep down through the pore space or infiltrate the soil. As this water makes its way down through the layers of the soil, many of the pollutants that it's carrying are actually trapped by the soil, allowing clean water to make it all the way down to our aquifers and recharge our groundwater with uncontaminated water. This essentially filters the water, recharging aquifers and other groundwater sources with clean drinking water that's very vital for humans. So now that we've covered how soil forms and why you shouldn't call it dirt, we need to take a look at some of the properties that influence its fertility or its ability to support plant growth. The first property we need to review is soil texture or the percentage of sand, silt, and clay that a soil is made up of. The reason this is so important is that these three particles have vastly different sizes, which give the soils that they make up vastly different characteristics. Now sand is the biggest particle by far, followed by silt, and then clay is the smallest. Now because bigger particles can't pack as tightly together, Particles of sand have much larger spaces or pores between them. So a soil with more sand will have larger pores and those larger pores will allow water to drain through the soil more easily. On the other hand, a soil with more clay will have much smaller pores and will not allow water to drain through nearly as quickly. So we call this ease or the speed with which water can move through a soil permeability. And the opposite of permeability is water holding capacity. So a soil with larger pore space that's highly permeable will have a really low water holding capacity and vice versa. Now in terms of water holding capacity and permeability, most plants need sort of a Goldilocks level of permeability. If a soil isn't permeable enough due to tightly packed clay particles with small pores, water will infiltrate really slowly. Now the soil will also hold so much water that it can drown the plant by preventing the roots from accessing oxygen. But on the other hand, if the soil is too permeable due to lots of sand and large pore space, then the water drains through too quickly. The plant's roots can't have access to the water before it drains through the soil and into the groundwater deeper. So soils with a mixture of sand, silt, and clay and a more intermediate pore size allow enough water to be held for the plant but not so much water that it drowns the roots. Now we can measure and quantify a soil's texture by measuring the percentage of sand, silt, and clay in the soil and using what's called a soil texture chart, sometimes called the soil texture triangle. So if you collect a soil sample and set it in a jar of water overnight, what will happen is it will separate by density. Then you can measure the depth of each layer so you can find where the percentage of sand, silt, and clay would intersect on this chart. So if we use this soil sample as an example, we can see that 20% clay 35% silt and 45% sand make this soil a loam. Now we can also have silty loams or sandy loams, which kind of sounds like a fire indie band name, but a true loam is a great example of this Goldilocks level of permeability that I mentioned earlier. So in addition to these physical properties like permeability or texture, soil also has chemical properties that are really important for determining how plants can grow in it. A great example of a chemical property of soil is soil pH. Remember that pH is a measure of acidity or basicity. So the lower the pH of the soil, the more acidic it is, and what that actually means is that it has a higher concentration of H plus ions. Now you don't need to remember key pH ranges of soil, but what you should know is that when soil pH goes down or when soil becomes more acidic, it can be degraded in two key ways. First, acidic soils have lower nutrient levels. This is because at lower pH levels or at higher acidity levels, the soil has a higher concentration of H plus ions and these H plus ions leach nutrients like nitrogen or calcium out of the soil. Since plants need these nutrients in order to grow, this can stunt or stop their growth altogether. And second, acidic soil can actually damage plants roots directly by making toxic metals like aluminum more soluble in the soil. So at lower pH levels, this increase in H plus ion concentration allows naturally occurring aluminum in the soil to dissolve more easily. This means that the aluminum is more free to enter plants roots, which damages them and limits their growth. So we know soil pH pH is critical to determining plant nutrient levels, but what about the actual nutrient levels themselves? Nitrogen and phosphorus levels of a soil are two additional chemical properties that are really important to determining plant growth. And that's because nitrogen and phosphorus are usually the two biggest limiting factors for plant growth in any ecosystem. Now, all of these chemical and physical properties of soil come together to determine something called a soil's fertility or its ability to support plant growth. We don't necessarily assign a number for soil fertility, but factors such as high nutrients would make a soil more fertile, while factors such as a low pH or acidic soil would make it less fertile. And since this is a really complex topic with lots of interweaving concepts and nuances, 
don't do yourself dirty and just assume you have it down. So stop the video now and see if you can fill out the chart for topic 4.3 in your ultimate review packet. It's a great way to test yourself and see if you really have these concepts down. So continuing our path outward from Earth's core to tectonic plates to the soil, we'll now ascend into the atmosphere and take a look at its different layers. Now remember that the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen at around 78%, but that nitrogen exists as N2 gas molecules that aren't biologically available until nitrogen fixation occurs, which converts them into a usable form like ammonia. Next, we have oxygen at just under 21%, then argon at just under 1%, and after that, there are a bunch of trace gases that make up the final 0.04% of the atmosphere. Now, it's important to point out here that even though greenhouse gases like methane and carbon dioxide make up just a small fraction of a percent of the entire atmosphere, their ability to trap heat means that even a tiny increase in their concentration can dramatically alter Earth's climate. Next, we'll take a look at the layers of Earth's atmosphere. For each layer, we need to know one or two key concepts as well as the temperature altitude relationship of that layer. First, we have the troposphere, which is the layer closest to Earth. This is where weather occurs and where the air that we breathe comes from. Now you can remember that the troposphere is the layer closest to us instead of memorizing it if you look at the prefix tropo. Tropo means change, and so you can think of the constantly changing weather that occurs in the troposphere. Next, we have the stratosphere, which you can remember is the second layer since it starts with an S. It's also the layer that saves us from the sun. Now this is because of the dense concentration of ozone molecules in this layer that absorb UVB and UVC rays that can mutate our DNA or cause cancer or cataracts. Then we have the mesosphere, which you can remember is the middlemost layer because it starts with an M. The key thing to remember here is that the gas molecules are becoming less and less dense as we get further from Earth's surface. Next, we have the thermosphere, which is the hottest layer of Earth's atmosphere because it receives the most direct solar radiation. This is also the region where the aurora borealis, or the northern lights, occur. This is because protons and electrons blown toward Earth by solar winds collide with nitrogen and oxygen in Earth's atmosphere and give off an array of colored light. And finally, we have the exosphere, which is the outermost layer of Earth's atmosphere, and it's essentially the space that's merging with outer space. Now, two Two key trends to understand about the layers of Earth's atmosphere is that at each successive level, we have less and less densely packed gas molecules, and at each successive level, we have an opposite temperature altitude relationship from the layer below. Now, we're not going to go into the physics of why each layer of the atmosphere has a different temperature altitude relationship, but the way you can remember this is that the troposphere of the layer closest to Earth gets colder as you go up in altitude. Just think about climbing a mountain and how much colder it gets when you get further away from Earth's surface. Then you can figure out the temperature gradient of any of the layers above by just reversing that relationship at each successive level. Now that we've covered all the different layers of Earth's atmosphere, we need to head back down to the troposphere and review global wind patterns as they occur at Earth's surface. But before we take a look at how air circulates across Earth's surface, we need to establish a few key properties of air so that we remember why air behaves this way instead of just memorizing wind pattern directions. The first key property is that warm air holds more moisture than cold air. The second key property is that warm air rises. Third, as air rises, it experiences less pressure, so it cools. And finally, the fourth key characteristic we need to remember is that water vapor in the air condenses when that air cools. Now let's start at the equator and take a look at how all of these properties combine to give us a circulation of air that we call the Hadley cell. Because the sun's rays strike the equator most directly, the air here is warmer than anywhere else on Earth, and it holds more moisture. This warm air rises, and as it rises, it expands and cools. That causes the moisture to condense and fall as rain. That air then continues to rise and cool as it experiences less pressure. But because warm air is continuously rising beneath it, it starts to spread out, eventually sinking back down to Earth around 30 degrees north and south. Now because this air has lost most of its moisture and is sinking back down to Earth, 30 degrees north and south are going to experience very dry, high pressure conditions. In fact, this is where we see a lot of Earth's deserts forming and it's because of this Hadley cell. Now, since this warm air at the equator is continually being heated by the sun and continually rising away from Earth's surface, the equator experiences really rainy, low pressure conditions. And since we know that air moves from high pressure to low pressure, we're gonna see this air sinking back down to Earth at 30 degrees north and south, flowing back towards the equator from high pressure to low pressure. Now, if you're following along really closely, you might be thinking, wait a minute, Mr. Smeads, Air doesn't just flow directly from 30 degrees north and south to the equator, and you'd be completely right. Between 30 degrees north and south and the equator, air is moving along Earth's surface back towards the equator. But there's just one issue here. As that air attempts to move in a straight path, 
the Earth beneath it is spinning at almost a thousand miles an hour. So the air between 30 degrees and the equator is actually deflected from east to west since the Earth is spinning from west to east beneath it. This gives us the eastern trade winds or the easterlies in this region of Earth. Uh, wait a minute, uh, bruh. Mr. Smeads, why do the arrows change direction from 30 degrees to 60 degrees? Ah, an excellent question from a very real high school student. It's because the surface rotation speed of Earth is different at different latitudes. Because the Earth has such a larger circumference at 30 degrees than it does at 60 degrees, the Earth's surface is moving much faster at 30 degrees than it is at 60, like 380 miles an hour faster. That means as air moves out towards 60 from 30 degrees north or south, the Earth begins spinning more slowly beneath it causing it to be deflected with the direction of Earth's spin from west to east. Now on topic 4.6, we'll be descending from the atmosphere back down to Earth's surface, where we'll be taking a look at watersheds. Remember that a watershed is just an area of land that drains into one central body of water. I like to help my students visualize this by picturing it as a giant land funnel, meaning that if a drop of water falls anywhere in a watershed, eventually the topography or the slope of the landscape will cause it to run off into that central body of water. Now, watersheds have some key characteristics that determine both the movement and quality of water in them. Slope is a really important characteristic of a watershed because it actually separates one watershed from another. So if a water droplet were to fall on either side of this dotted ridge, it would be in a different watershed and it would run off into a different body of water. Slope also helps determine how much of the precipitation in watershed can hit the soil and infiltrate into groundwater beneath versus how much flows across the surface as runoff. The steeper the slope, the less chance that water has to infiltrate the soil and the more likely it is to run off across the surface of the slope. Vegetation and soil type also play a big role in determining the quality of water within a watershed. The more vegetation or the more permeable soil that you have in an area, the more water can infiltrate into the groundwater and the more pollutants that can be filtered out of it by that soil and by those plants roots. If we look at our watershed diagram, we can also think about how land use impacts water movement and quality in the watershed. See, when runoff hits large areas of vegetation like this forest here, it's going to be absorbed by the tree's roots and infiltrate into this more permeable soil. But if we look at this urban area with all of its pavement and other impermeable surfaces, it's going to be causing a lot of the rainwater that falls here to become runoff. This might be water flowing into storm drains or just into this river directly, which is a problem because urban pollutants like sediment, plastic, motor oil, or lawn fertilizer can flow into the river with that runoff. Now on topic 4.7, we'll review Earth's seasons, and we have to leave Earth altogether and start 93 million miles away with the sun. The amount of the sun's rays or the solar radiation that an area on Earth receives is called insulation, and it's one of the main reasons for the seasons. We measure insulation in watts, a unit of energy, per meter squared, a unit of area. Now that we've reviewed what insulation is, we have to look at why it varies across Earth's surface for a number of different reasons. The first is the curvature of Earth's surface relative to the angle of the sun's rays. Areas close to the equator receive much more direct radiation at a near perpendicular angle. This concentrates the amount of solar energy on a smaller area, which increases insulation. Areas at higher latitudes further away from the equator are going to receive less direct solar radiation, because the sun's rays are striking at a more oblique angle. This means that those rays are spread over a larger surface area because of the curvature of Earth's surface. Another factor that causes higher latitudes to receive less insulation is the amount of atmosphere that the sun's rays pass through. Again, because of the curvature of the Earth at higher latitudes, the sun's rays have to travel through more atmosphere which causes a lot of the solar radiation to be scattered by all the gas molecules that make up the atmosphere. Now we'll review how seasons on Earth work, which is a major source of confusion for ape students every year. The key to the seasons is to remember that they happen due to Earth's tilt, not the Earth getting closer or further away from the sun. So remember that as the Earth orbits the sun, it's tilted at about 23.5 degrees on its axis. This means that at certain points in the year, the northern or southern hemisphere will be tilted closer to the sun than the other. This causes the hemisphere tilted closer to the sun to experience summer, while the hemisphere tilted further away from the sun experiences winter. So let's review by walking through a detailed diagram of Earth's tilt relative to the sun at each of the four seasons. We'll start with summer in the northern hemisphere, which begins on the summer solstice or June 21st. At this position, the northern hemisphere is tilted maximally towards the sun. This means that it's receiving a more direct or a more perpendicular angle of solar radiation. This more direct insulation is what makes summer warmer. This tilt towards the sun also makes this the longest day of the year in the northern hemisphere. Meanwhile, all of this is the opposite in the southern hemisphere. June 21st is their shortest day of the year and the beginning of their winter as they're tilted away from the sun and receiving less direct insulation. Something else to point out here is that the sun's rays are hitting most directly at 23.5 degrees north latitude, 
which we call the Tropic of Cancer. Now, as we progress from summer to fall in the Northern Hemisphere, we reach the September equinox, anywhere from September 21st to 24th. At this position, the Earth's tilt is basically positioning the Earth parallel to the sun, so both hemispheres are equally exposed to the sun. Day length will be roughly equal at each relative latitude in the Northern and Southern Hemispheres, and the sun's rays will fall most directly on the equator. As we make our way over to the December solstice on December 21st, we're now in winter in the Northern Hemisphere and summer in the Southern Hemisphere. Everything that we reviewed during the June solstice is now occurring for the Southern Hemisphere. The Southern Hemisphere is maximally tilted towards the sun, it's the longest day of the year in the Southern Hemisphere, and the shortest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. And just like 23.5 degrees North latitude received the most direct insulation during the June solstice, 23.5 degrees south is going to receive the most direct insulation during the December solstice. We call this latitude the Tropic of Capricorn. And finally, we have the spring equinox in the Northern Hemisphere on March 20 or 21st, and all the same conditions from the September equinox apply here. Equal insulation reaching both hemispheres, the equator receiving the most direct sunlight, and equal day length in both Northern and Southern hemispheres. Now on topic 4.8, we need to go back down to Earth's surface so we can review how geography can influence climate. Specifically, we'll be looking at how proximity to a large body of water or a mountain range can alter the temperature and precipitation patterns in a region. The first thing we need to review is that when prevailing winds move across a body of water and onto a body of land, they carry a lot of moisture in that air picked up over the body of water. And that's because as this mass of air is moving over the body of water, a lot of that water is evaporating from the ocean or the lake that the air is moving over to, and it's transporting it into the air. So if we look at the Great Lakes region where I'm from, we can see that the area of land just each of each Great Lake experiences what we call a snow belt. Now these areas receive especially high amounts of snowfall because the prevailing winds in this region move from west to east, picking up moisture from the Great Lakes and then depositing that moisture as snow when they move over land. Now, if we zoom into Michigan more specifically, we can see just how pronounced this lake effect snow or this snow belt is. As the prevailing winds move in from the west, they pick up tons of moisture from Lake Michigan and when that air mass hits land, it cools down. Remember that when air cools, it can't hold as much moisture, so that moisture condenses and falls in precipitation. In this case, snow. And you can see just how much this snowfall tapers off as we move from west to east across the state. This is because that air mass coming in off Lake Michigan has less moisture left after snowing so much on the western portion of the state. Now Michigan's pretty flat, but what happens when we introduce a mountain range to the equation? This pattern of high precipitation along the coast and less precipitation further inland is still there, but it's way more pronounced when we have a mountain range present. So as the prevailing winds come in off the ocean, they're carrying all of that moisture they picked up from the water. Now, as this air mass hits the windward side of the mountain or the portion that faces into the wind, that air rises and cools. And remember that as air cools, its moisture has to condense and fall as precipitation. This means that the windward side of the mountain receives a ton of rainfall and often supports lush, thriving forests. Now, as that air mass goes over the mountain and starts to descend down the leeward side or the side of the mountain facing away from the wind, it's much drier. This is because it lost so much of its moisture as precipitation on the windward side. So this creates really arid or dry conditions and often leads to deserts forming on the leeward side of the mountain. Now we call this pattern of precipitation that forms along mountain ranges the rain shadow effect. And that's because the clouds that form as this precipitation falls cast a shadow on this windward side of the mountain. Now if we go out west and look at California's Sierra Nevada mountain range, we can see a perfect example of the rain shadow effect. The western side or the windward side of this mountain range receives much more precipitation than almost anywhere else in the region. While the leeward side, on the other hand, experiences some of the driest conditions in the whole country. The Mojave Desert and Death Valley are two perfect illustrations of just how dry the leeward side of a large mountain range can be. So now that we've covered the atmosphere, the soil beneath us, the Earth's core all the way at the center, we need to cover the final frontier of Earth science, which is the oceans. In topic 4.9, we'll review a unique ocean phenomenon called the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. The first thing we need to do is establish where ENSO occurs. And this is the tropical or equatorial Pacific Ocean. The other thing we should establish is why it's called ENSO. The key is to remember that it's an oscillation or an alternation between two extremes. On the one end of the spectrum, we have the El Nino conditions, on the other end of the spectrum, we have the La Nina conditions with normal oceanic circulation in the middle. So before we can take a look at what happens during an El Nino event or a La Nina event, we have to take a look at how the ocean circulates normally in this region on Earth. So normally in the equatorial Pacific, trade winds blow warm surface waters from east to west, bringing warm temperatures, low pressure air systems, and lots of rainfall to Australia and Southeast Asia. Because this warm surface water is being blown away from the coast of the Americas, 
cold, oxygen-rich, and nutrient-rich waters are going to move up to the surface to replace those warm surface waters. We call this process upwelling. This makes for colder, drier conditions along the coast of South America, but it also makes for really productive fisheries. Aquatic species living near the surface are getting more access to oxygen and nutrients, and fishermen are benefiting from larger catches due to this upwelling. Now we call this balance between the warm surface waters and the colder, deeper waters the thermocline. In normal conditions, the thermocline tilts from east to west, meaning that in the east, cold ocean water is rising up to replace the warm surface water that's blowing towards the west. Now in an El Nino year, these eastern trade winds weaken and even reverse directions in some instances. This results in the warm surface waters pooling up along the coast of South America instead of over in the west near Australia and Southeast Asia. This basically flips the normal weather patterns that we just talked about. So South America is now getting the warmer weather, the low pressure systems, and the higher than average rainfall. Unfortunately, this can lead to flooding and landslides. Southeast Asia and Australia, meanwhile, are receiving colder, drier than average weather, which can bring about drought-like conditions. The other issue that this creates for South America is a suppression of upwelling, meaning that their fisheries suffer from warmer water and a lack of oxygen and nutrients. This is gonna result in a flattening or a leveling of the thermocline. This keeps warmer surface waters near the top, colder, deeper waters near the bottom, and leads to generally warmer temperatures in this hemisphere. Now in a La Nina year, the eastern trade winds have been reestablished and even intensified. We have greater than normal movement of warm surface waters to the west, and this results in warmer than normal weather and higher than average rainfall in Southeast Asia and Australia. Now Australia and Southeast Asia may be the ones experiencing flash flooding. South America, on the other hand, experiences colder and drier conditions than normal, which can cause droughts in the coastal regions especially. But on a positive note, these stronger than normal trade winds are blowing more of the warm surface water westward, which creates a stronger upwelling along the coast of South America. This leads to a steeper thermocline and brings up more of that cold, deep ocean water that has more oxygen and nutrients to support the fisheries. And there you have it, four units down, only five to go before you become one with the apes universe. We've unearthed some of the mysteries of soil, broken ground on plate tectonics, and ascended into a higher level of understanding of the atmosphere. All right, all right, I'll stop. Thanks for tuning in today, Ape Scholars. And as always, think like a mountain and write like a scholar.